Hey, y'all. So in this short lecture, we're going to talk about Mary Parker Follett and her contribution to the Human Relations School of Organizational Communication. So a little bit about uh, Mary Parker Follett. She, her mode of thinking, this is her over here, by the way, she doesn't look too happy, but uh, she's a smart lady. Uh, her thinking was informed by uh, the thinking of uh, scholars like John Dewey, and the philosopher William James, right, who, who was the sort of uh, one of the founding uh, fathers of pragmatism. So uh, Parker uh, believed that truth was not necessarily uh, static, meaning that it wasn't always constant, uh, nor was it really objectively real outside of the realm of human thought, right? So, so for her, there, there were no real universal or, or constant truths, right, uh, that existed outside uh, of the way people thought about things, right? Uh, and as a result, uh, being informed by this, she, she wanted to, to create a, a, an idea of society that would really help ordinary people realize uh, their full potential uh, and improve the quality of their lives, right? So uh, even though she was something of a, of a moral relativist, right? Um, she also was a pragmatist. So she was interested uh, in uh, sort of uh, the greatest good for, for, for the greatest number of, of people. Uh, so central to her thinking is the notion of what she calls circular response. And this is a little complicated, so bear with me. Uh, but this idea of circular response was, was really sort of the basis for her whole concept of organization. And it maintains, or it says, that when two or more people communicate, the very act of communicating changes everyone involved, right? So, so think about this a little bit, right? So if, if you talk to someone, right, particularly if you talk to someone about something kind of important, right, like work, the, the, the very act of communicating with them, the very act of talking with them changes everyone. Right? Your experience of other people and their experience of you changes them right? and you. So this is what she argues, right? that, that by communicating with people, it changes us and it changes them as well. And it also changes the environment in which the process is occurring. So, for example, if, if I communicate with you and we just don't get along, right? if I communicate with you, uh, that has an effect on me as a person, changes who I am. Right? And it changes the environment. If we're like, oh, you know, F you, uh, I mean, that changes the environment we're communicating in. It becomes uh, tinged with, with these bad feelings, right? It, it changes the whole nature of our environment as well as ourselves. And, and the same could be said if we communicate and we get along really well. That creates a positive environment. And, it, and in theory, it changes both of us for the good. So she said, uh, as a result of this, right, I never react to, to you but instead, you plus me, right? So what you're reacting to isn't just the other person when you communicate with them. You're reacting to the combination of, 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 of your two personalities, of your communication. Um, so by the very process of meeting, right, she says we both become something different. And, and this isn't, I mean, although it sounds like a, maybe a little bit of a crazy idea, I submit to you it really isn't that, that crazy, right? I mean, this is one of the reasons why it's good to travel, why it's good to go out and meet different kinds of people, right? How the, I mean, we know that going out and traveling and meeting new people can help you grow as a person. It changes who you are. Experiencing other people changes who you are as a person. And, and that's, that's sort of the key to her idea of circular response, right? That, that, that working or communicating with someone else changes both of you and it changes the environment that you work in. And, and this is central to her whole idea of, of HR management and HR control. So in keeping with this, she, she says there, there are really three ways that she sees of dealing with conflict in organizational life. And the first is domination. That's where the interests and goals of one person are just asserted over those of another. We see domination all the time in, in workplace environments where what the boss says goes, and if you don't like it, you can leave, right? An example of this would be firing workers that go on strike. If you go on strike because you want better working conditions, you want better benefits, you want to be paid more, I can just fire you. 
And if I do that, that's, that's domination. The second way is compromise. And this is where both parties agree to give something up in order to, to resolve the conflict. So an example of this might be if the union sacrifices pay raises uh, for, for a no layoffs agreement. So listen, you don't have to give us a raise, but you do have to promise that you're not going to fire anybody or lay anybody off for the next year. And so that's an example of compromise. And then finally, there's this uh, level of integration, right, or, or this mode of integration where the, the two parties can find a solution in which neither side has to make a sacrifice. And clearly, this is where you want to be, right, when it comes to, to management. If you can work it out so, so that there's a solution where no one has to give up anything to achieve, and they both achieve what they want, that's, that's the goal, right? That's where you want to be, according to Follett's line of thinking. So unlike Elton Mayo, Follett saw workplace conflict as just part of the natural dynamics of the workplace. You remember, for Mayo, he said if there's conflict, then that's just because the, the management is not using the right psych psychological techniques to, to get the most out of their workers. Follett says, listen, conflict is going to happen no matter what. It's part of working, right? It's part of social life. And, and she says, we need, instead of saying this is bad, we need to harness it and we need to use it to promote creativity and, and, and use it to come up with, with new solutions to old problems, right? To come up with original solutions to problems. And so her approach to conflict really emphasized a uh, common purpose, Right? So, so she said, listen, what we need to stress here is the fact that we're all working towards the same goal. And if we do this, it's going to promote a spirit of workplace cooperation. Management, owners, workers, ultimately, they're all working towards the same goal. And that's what you want people to realize from her perspective. Right? Now, obviously, getting people to work towards the same goal involves... Uh, it, the exercise of power. And so she said there are two forms of power we can think about. There's power over, and power over is sort of the normal uh, mode of power you're probably most familiar with, where the manager just asserts his or her uh, authority over the worker. Do this because I said so, right? But then there's power with, and power with is power that's developed, uh, uh, well, it's developed with the other person, right? It's a co-active kind of power as opposed to a coercive power. So that's, that's where you say, listen, uh, you know, I, don't do this just because I say so. In, instead, let's, let's work out uh, some sort of agreement where we, we, we work together, right? We exert our power together. So it's not just because I'm telling you to do it or you're fired, it's because you want to do it, right? That's, that's power with. And she also said, that authority really arises out of what she called the law of the situation. So uh, this means that authority comes directly out of the needs of the situation. And that orders are followed not because of the power of the individual, but because the situation calls for action, right? Uh, so in other words, she says real authority doesn't come out of a title or, or being uh, you know, made manager by the people who own the business. You don't get authority that way. The way you get authority is out of the situation that you work in, right? If something needs to be done, that's where authority comes directly out of that, right? It arises out of the situation, not out of authority that's, that's just simply vested in people, right? So one way you can think of this, right, is, it, you know, we've all seen uh, like the disaster movies and things where, where one person becomes the leader of a group of people, and, and Follett would say, well, that's the way, you know, authority is really vested in people. It comes out of the situation, not because someone's given a title. It's earned, and it arises out of the situation you're in, right? That was her idea of, of how authority is vested in people. Now, tragically, you know, Follett's work was, was sort of lost for a long time. It was work that a lot of people didn't pay attention to. And part of this was because she was probably ahead of her time. Uh, after 1933, her work kind of disappears from, from all, the, all the, the, 
the, the texts and discourse on uh, management. And, and so people have wondered, why did this happen? Because this woman had really smart ideas. And some people thought it was because of gender, because she was a woman. Some people thought it was because her thinking was just too complex. It, it was too rich, too advanced for the time period and the situation, right? I mean, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Uh, business people don't like complex ideas. They like simple ideas, right? Uh, capitalism at its base is a very simple concept. And, and the more simple work can be, the happier people are with it, particularly the people in charge. So, so a lot of people didn't want to think about, oh, well, when I interact with my employees, it changes me and we need to, right? I mean, they, it, it's, it's much easier just to say, do this work because I fucking said so, <laughs> right? Um, so some people didn't like the fact that her thinking was, was, was really complex. And then also it was radical from a political standpoint. Right. Um, and, and so all of these, in theory, probably contributed to why her work disappeared for a while. But the, the good news is that it, it has come back to the fore and, and, and she's the subject of great interest today. Um, so, so she's finally sort of getting the uh, recognition that she deserves. OK, so uh, that's it for this short lecture. Next time we'll talk a little bit about uh, human relations management. Thanks for checking this video out.